So, all right. Also, let me know if everyone can see my screen. Awesome. So welcome everyone to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. My name is Mike McCoy. I'm our chair and host for the day. Uh, first off, before we get into our introductions and our topics of conversation today, I want to be able to note we have a uh, kind of no jerk policy and a no, uh, no describing major business um, secrets here within the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. Pretty much the rules are uh, this is an open environment, respect everyone's thoughts, questions, or ideas. Some people just have learned about blockchain technology within the past year. Others have been in this for five, seven, 10 years at the same time. We want to be able to give respect and uh, space for everyone to ask their questions and to be able to, to answer these uh, topics uh, kindly and with um, enough patience as possible. And then also, if there's something proprietary and something that is an industry secret to you and your business, please do not disclose this here as this is an open source working group. Do not share industry, industry secrets that you believe uh, your company, your employer, or yourself would not want to uh, have um, discussed to everyone else. So um, that's just the caveat there. I'd love to give the time for anyone who is new to our group, who is not a consistent member to give an introduction uh, on themselves if they, they are, uh, open to doing so. I know Pete Harris, I've, I've interacted with him in other blockchain events, but uh, I don't know if you've ever joined us in the healthcare SIG. So, so welcome, Pete, if you want to give a quick, quick introduction. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, hi Mike. Thanks for the uh, shout out there. Um, tuning in uh, from Austin, Texas, uh, where I live currently, currently being the operative word. Um, but yeah, um, been very involved in the blockchain space here in Austin. Um, just uh, last week, I think last week, actually spun out from uh, the Austin Blockchain Collective a new organization called Decentratech Collective about all the aspects of decentralization uh, technology, um, of which uh, applications in decentralized health is going to be a big uh, a big uh, focus I think uh, very interesting news from Microsoft yesterday with regard to that so um, yeah lovely to be part of this and um, gonna be you, you, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more of me in the future I'm sure thanks a lot you love to see it love to see it um, I believe we have a lot of names I'm recognizing on the list here but Adrian Groper uh, Gropper sorry uh, please introduce yourself to the group. Uh, sure. I, uh, I'm a long time participant in um, self-sovereign technology for health records. I uh, joined the self-sovereign identity bandwagon uh, very early, five years ago, in the standards groups. And uh, I, I sort of lead or a, uh, an implementation uh, not a, not a business, uh, at least not these days, it never has been, uh, but a uh, reference implementation of a self-sovereign health record called HIE of One. That is awesome. I'm sure we'll all love to learn more details about that uh, potentially for another discussion. Uh, is there anyone else that is new to the group that has not introduced themselves before for these kind of more informal uh, general meeting agendas? Uh, please feel free to do so. I'll give the floor to you. Hi, I, I can make an introduction uh, as well. Uh, I don't remember if I, I, I did so before, but I've, I've been uh, participating in, in a few meetings now. Uh, so, so my name is Anton. I'm, uh, uh, I currently live in, in Sweden. Uh, I'm a, a researcher at the um, Norwegian University where I do research on uh, blockchain applications within the healthcare and uh, especially uh, doing projects within uh, health professional credentials uh, system and uh, uh, also now uh, addressing the current uh, vaccination certificates uh, with, the, with sort of a side project. So yeah, and uh, generally quite interesting in, in all all things blockchain and uh, health technology. Thanks. Anton, thank you very much for giving the introduction. And I'd love to give uh, Marta, who works on the uh, Hyperledger team, to, if, if she's 
for you to give an introduction on yourself and, and what you do within the Hyperledger team. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Marta Gierpikarska, I'm Director of Ecosystem for Hyperledger. Uh, great to see Adrian again. We've crossed paths many a times before. Uh, and yeah, I'm the point of contact for uh, Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. Uh, been with the company for over almost five years now and I'm responsible for kind of building the collaboration between all the community participants being SIGs or enterprise members or the open source developer community. And Marta helps us out and get the word out on some of our events and, and other things as well. So she's she's a great resource and, and a great person to connect with. All right. So um, is there any community announcements? I'm, I'm sure Jim has some announcements on, on some of the projects he's been doing, but anything you'd like to be able to announce out here to the Hyperledger Healthcare SIG from anyone, please, the floor is yours for these five to 10 minutes. And this could be any announcements of recent product launches, recent open source initiatives, recent events, conferences, hackathons, anything that you would like to discuss, please, anyone can uh, feel free. Yeah, the, there's no other, uh, the Microsoft announcement for uh, support of verifiable credentials. I think it was mentioned just a little bit earlier is very interesting um, and uh, they have gone full uh, bore promoting <clears throat> verifiable credentials for multiple you know uh, use cases which i find uh, i think it's uh, worthwhile to note that we have a major player in uh, you know in the enterprise world supporting this i think uh, let me uh, i can post the link here in just a second mike Sounds good. Yeah, this is. Uh, I think it's been known for some time. A lot of us know people like York and, and Dan Buckner, who who work in uh, uh, currently decentralized identity within Microsoft. I think that was huge. Uh, they've been exploring the space for quite some time. Uh, very uh, biased towards the ion method. Yes. In, but that's that's their play, and that's a uh, very much. Uh, something worth, worthwhile. Any, uh, any other announcements from anyone else? Maybe not an announcement, but an interesting thing. Um, so some of you may know I live in England and today in the morning, waking up to BBC Radio 4, um, I heard an interview with a person from IATA talking about their COVID credentials and vaccine pass. Uh, that is built, they didn't say how it's exactly built, but they were talking about decentralized um, system and uh, how it's very secure and they'll be introducing it. And uh, as some of you may know, this is a system built by Evernim and it's built based on Hyperledger Indy. So it's quite cool to just hear radio talking about the thing that you know, you know you're kind of half working on. No, it's really cool. I mean, uh... Jim could probably talk to the, the IATA stuff too a little bit more, but uh, I was just on a conversation uh, the other day with a, a group who's created a COVID-19 vaccination credential or a VCDID, and they're based in Maryland. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're, they're connected with all these different groups as well. And it's a, it's a small world, but uh, I think we're all on the same page of, we want to interoperate all our different uh, DIDs and VC methods. And I want to make sure that we can, not have to carry around a paper to be able to understand that we took a COVID vaccine or not. Anyone else? Any other things that piqued your interest? So. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to have our patient or payer or healthcare interoperability subgroup leads to be able to join today. Uh, Steve recently, Steve Elliott had a, um, uh, a meeting on Monday to kind of talk about the progress of what their group has made. Uh, I highly suggest joining their sessions every other Monday. If you want to join the subgroup, I'll add the link in here in a second once I'm done sharing. Uh, but Ravish and uh, Denise have had uh, somewhat, uh, Denise is just looking for a sponsor, like a corporate sponsor to be able to take on his EHR interoperability method 
And then uh, Ravish is still in the development stages of his, uh, uh, of his solution as well. So uh, those are the updates I'm aware of. I also wanted to say for ad hoc team updates or not just ad hoc team updates, um, just news in general. I'm a part of this uh, blockchain healthcare telegram group that was hosted by my friend, uh, Robert Miller and, and some others, um, Ray Dogham as well. And, and some other people that are kind of influential in our blockchain healthcare space are, are very much trying to, uh, uh, there's so many great conversations, so many back and forth here. So if anyone wants to join this telegram group, you guys have my email. Uh, please send me uh, a ping or a message so I can add you to this group. Uh, it's just been rewarding conversation and I get a lot of news updates and things that I'm not truly aware of uh, from this group as well. So it's a uh, it's good interaction there. Ray Doggum's podcast recently, he interviewed, I believe, someone from Meta Ledger recently on their new chargeback solution, which was kind of interesting. And then um, we also have more information for uh, Linux Foundation Public Health Forum. Uh, Marta, do you have any details? Uh, so recently, Brian Bellendorf, who is the executive director of the Hyperledger overall uh, project, has now taken on lead uh, to become the executive director of the Linux Foundation Public Health Forum as well. Uh, Marta in particular, do you have any details or things you can add beyond, beyond that? Uh, about uh, what they're doing or about Brian taking on the role? Uh, basically, they are just, yeah, um, they are just starting off and trying to understand uh, where do they fit and what they can do together. They are trying to uh, build out uh, another COVID initiative um, and uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, just educating the public and uh, looking for really for corporate members because one of the things that all of those networks need is obviously corporate members, so um, they are slowly, slowly but surely working on that. It's it's early days, they are organizing regular webinars. Absolutely, and I was told from Daniela, who kind of manages their partnerships across the, the world, that uh, they're looking for more open source devs and people to contribute uh, into the different forums. And they even have some bounties and reward systems that can be able to help out uh, startups and, and early stage development companies. but um, but yeah, if you want to join uh, different part projects like uh, COVID Green or COVID Shield, uh, this could be a very interesting way for you to get more deeper into the um, into the identity and into the COVID nineteen credential space. So uh, they are calling all contributors, and you can view all the projects. Uh, has anyone had any exposure to some of the different projects that they have uh, done so far, or that they've announced so far? Cool. I guess that means we just got to get more exposure into it. So uh, check it out. Feel free. The link is there in the chat. Uh, awesome. Next up. So I want to get into some interesting topics that are at least piqued my interest this week when it came to uh, blockchain healthcare and kind of the intersection of all that. So Singapore recently has developed a new standard for cross-border verification of COVID-19 tests. And uh, I sent this out to the group yesterday as you guys were, were joining. Um, they have been, in my opinion, in the forefront and the lead of being able to create digital health verification methods uh, since they had, I think it was called uh, Trace Together or, or something like that that came out in the early spring. And, and citizens of Singapore have actually been entering in at high rates to be able to connect into these. But now they have a, a, a mobile application called SingPass, I believe, that is going to be able to you scan a QR code you then connect it into your medical record that is actually hosted by the Ministry of Health, which is kind of like their, um, you know, their, their governing body of all health records. And then you could be able to uh, have approval and verification and tied to a, v a vaccination credential that you have or have not been uh, vaccinated or have been diagnosed with COVID. So uh, they use though a particular, they use not just one uh, approval method, but they use not only blockchain approval methods, but some other ones as well through this uh, function called health certs. And in our update that I sent yesterday, sorry, in the links, I, I thought it was interesting. They have all these approved health cert participants, providers. Uh, three of them said that they apply blockchain technology into what they build. 
such as in 3D certs of Credify um, and some others. But uh, but yeah, anyone have any other thoughts or comments on on these findings? I'm sure everyone has to have an opinion on some of this. Yeah, we uh, <clears throat> talked to a group <clears throat> out of, uh, it's called Affinity, I believe, uh, Mike. Uh, and we got uh, to know about them from the CCI meetings, you know, the biweekly presentations. And uh, Affinity was talking about exactly this. And uh, since, as you know, we, uh, you know, uh, we have been at in my company, we have been developing um, similar products. We talked to them about how to interoperate with uh, their environment. And uh, we specifically mentioned uh, the fact that, you know, uh, we are working with Evernem and, you know, we are W3C standards and so on. And they were um, uh, very open to the fact that all of these need to interoperate, just like what you mentioned they wanted the ability for their uh, verifiers to be able to verify, potentially accept multiple document types, right? Because we are not all going to stick to a single standard. Uh, so, and then, then there is also the use case of, you know, some people want to still bring in a paper document. So they wanted a QR code based um, uh, verification possible along with, of course, uh, an electronic verification um, including uh, support of DITCOM. So uh, they had some interesting suggestions as to how it should work. In other words, everybody should, uh, the minimum requirement is everybody should be able to present uh, uh, QR code uh, as opposed to, you know, some other uh, methods of protocol initiation because they said that will make it easy for, uh, say, their, uh, you know, uh, airport authorities to just follow, you know, they are expecting a QR code, the software will do the uh, rest of it by identifying what type of uh, pass this is and so on and so forth. So what I thought was interesting, though, is the first cross border news that I've seen out at least right and uh, uh, for the most part, people are trying to win over their, their national governments. Um, yeah. And we haven't gotten to the cross country interoperability method yet. I know Good health pass and Jim, you guys are, are stating that as well. But this was something that is you know functional across the country and then looking to connect with other entities as well. But I know you guys are connected with Providence uh, and all that. Um, do you guys have in your roadmap plans to kind of do intercontinental uh, good health pass um, approval processes or, or use cases? Jim, are you on with us? I am. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't hear the call out. I'm, I was juggling another Zoom that I didn't realize I had same time. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. Uh, I just asked if you guys had on the roadmap to, to do intercontinental, um, you know, VC type of use cases. Great question. And uh, the answer is no. We're sticking to our knitting. So we're specifically focused on providing a, uh, you know, whatever is a universally acceptable, verifiable credential for a vaccine from, from points of vaccination, whether it's at the health system or a lab. But then as part of Good Health Pass, we want to ensure that our credential as well as everybody else's credentials function at a universal level in conjunction with IATA travel pass and then any other regional requirements. Very good to know. Very good to know. So that's all I had on there. Uh, any other comments on the Singapore initiative? Actually, I did kind of have a question because I was just on the phone with Affinity a couple of days ago or a couple of evenings ago. And when I mentioned about the self-sovereign principles, they were saying that um, that they're presenting as a verifiable credential, but they're still also demanding the contents of what the certificate says in terms of the actual information, which I, I thought was a little contradictory. It's, it's contradictory to our approach on a zero knowledge proof. So I'd appreciate any feedback on that. Maybe it was just a misunderstanding. Uh, you are right, Jim, uh, in our conversations too, 
right now they are at the more because of the multiple methods in which you can make a presentation right because as you correctly point out with the, the technology we have we have the ability to do attribute based uh, signatures and therefore have a, an extremely nuanced presentation um, they are also i think trying to solve this problem across the board by just accepting say for example a paper qr code type of thing and therefore at this stage i think they are sticking to just present me the whole credential kind of situation which you are right is not uh, the ideal privacy preserving way of doing it but i guess uh, if you want to play the game that's where you start <laughs> well said sir and thank you for the clarification yeah and and um i know it's been discussed discussed amongst the circles the who is going to put out a certificate format but to whether or not any particular one of the 200 countries makes that centralized or decentralized, unfortunately, will fall down to regional proclivities. That is very good to know. Awesome. Uh, I will get back to then our next topics. Any other questions on this in particular? I, if anybody is, I, and I don't want to like hijack the call if that wasn't the plan, but I'd love to hear a bit more about Good Health Pass because it was mentioned here. Um, but if it's not the scope of the call, then I'm just going to listen. No, that's the point. We all want to educate and learn. Um, Jim, if you want, you're a Good Health Pass representative and, and Shepard, would you, if, if, if you're not too busy on the other call, could you describe it to Marta, please? He probably went on the other call. <laughs> no worries, I'll I'll check next time. Yeah, we'll ping. Uh, Jim, you might be able to. Somebody had might have his email, and you could be able to ping oh. in particular. Good health pass. Um, from my perspective, is uh, within Lumetic and Lumetic Exchange. Uh, they have uh, uh, they've connected with NRNM standards and using Hyperland and D similar to as, as, as other projects, but they have their own um, type of verifiable credential DID method that I believe wraps in JWTs. So um, yeah, you can also check the link here. Uh, and uh, and I'm not doing it as justice as much as Jim could, but that's kind of the overall. So I, I have a a related question for the group. Uh, it would be have been good if Jim was on, but it, uh, maybe others of you uh, have feelings about this. Uh, he he raised uh, the privacy benefits of um, um, uh, zero knowledge proofs, and I'm just curious whether, in this context, uh, people understand or or have something to say about how do you standardize the context for a request like that, uh, given that vaccinations and testing tend to be relatively fluid uh, things. So it, it's hard to uh, request a standardized presentation in reality. And I'm, I'm just curious how, if anybody has feelings about that or thoughts as to whether that's actually feasible. about whether you could be able to standardize ZKPs in particular so that um, they could be auditable, you can trust it, and that you're uh, almost surely... Um, I'm saying in the context, yeah, when, when the context is fluid because, uh, you know, vaccinations uh, are not, you know, COVID vaccines are not like mumps vaccines, let's say, right? Where you had one a hundred years ago and that's it. It's, it's a yes or no answer. Um, uh, and when testing has, you know, uh, depends to some extent on, you know, what the prevalence is, uh, and where you did the test and where you've been. Uh, so I'm just asking whether zero knowledge proof approaches, uh, have run into an issue with the context being unclear, uh, so that you can't really interpret a credential in a specified way in order to say, yes, you know, I, I've been vaccinated or I've had the test and I'm negative. 
That's a great point, Adrian. And that's, that's, uh, that, that represents one of the kind of the tenets of what we're going after for good health pass, which is, you know, maintaining privacy, preserving infrastructure, Uber Ales. Uh, but in that context, it's not only just, Hey, I've had a credential and you can trust my credential, but if there are, and, and that's a credential around vaccinations plus credentials around testing. So then the question becomes, are there, um, temporal rules or constraints, temporal regional rules or constraints that have to be enacted upon the verifiable presentation at the same time to say, I have a vaccine, um, you're, in, um, um, you're in Iceland and Iceland accepts the Moderna vaccine and my record shows I had Moderna or I'm attesting I've had Moderna and I've had a, 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 a negative test in the last 24 hours and that's what one of the travel constraints are. So, so building in that rules engine to, to support the verifiable presentation in the context of a privacy preserving way is kind of the mess we're sorting through. If yeah. that it's a good point, uh, Jim. I think maybe the first place, uh, Adrian, is uh, there are some attempts, uh, right, even within the LFPH uh, CCI uh, schema group to first start with studying some of the published, uh, like the EU uh, standards on what constitutes the attributes of such a credential. Let us say the COVID-19 uh, related uh, credential as an example, right? That's what trying to come up with a minimal set of attributes so that as Jim pointed out, subsequent to that, you could build a, a rules engine, uh, you know, obviously compliant based on the destination that you're going to uh, and then at least uh, be dependent on uh, the fact that these attributes are going to be presented. And as you know, the schema definitions, there are a couple of ways depending on the presentation style, whether it's JSON LD and the ad context, wherein you understand what is the ontology of that particular presentation, or it could be the hyperledger indie style, you know, pull it out of a blockchain kind of a, uh, thing so so I think in reality, Adrian, it, uh, the verifier is going to become a, a lot more sophisticated than many of the examples uh, we ourselves have all seen. Uh, in uh, you know back to Jim's point, and more of a rules engine based, which can be quickly programmed, uh, but maybe it can depend on at least a base set of attributes um, that are somewhat standardized. I think we are trying to attack both those problems. Yeah, I, I agree, and I'm I'm extrapolating a little bit beyond my intellect here, but um, my understanding is with if if in fact we go with a a internationally recognized JSON LD standard and JSON supports RDF, and RDF can be used as a basis for a semantic rules engine, there might be a relatively easy path for harmonization, but but I'm not certain. Well, uh, Jim, I, I say I really appreciate the way you repeated and described the problem uh, of what I call the context. And uh, I, I think it's a, it, you said it very succinctly, and it's not often said uh, in many of these vaccine uh, credentials or uh, immunity or passport in general. You know, people throw away, throw around the word passport. Uh, all the time with something else in front of it, uh, health passport, uh, health cards, uh, et cetera. And uh, I think uh, you, you should uh, have the what you said embroidered and uh, posted somewhere. Uh, if anything, they should the just wall. call them computationally verifiable credentials because, I mean, adding social trust and adding people to actually trust the credential itself is a whole other question. And that, you know, bases another contextual or semantic representation of it as well. Uh, I am seeing too about the, uh, if JSON or uh, JSON web tokens can support RDFs, then you have that international ability to connect, but um, certain regions, borders, countries uh, may not be willing to do so. And so that's where the education evangelization aspect is, is greatly coming along and uh, when it comes to the uh, countries, uh, governments understanding this technology, we're in the first inning, 100%, and um, and we're hoping 
sessions like this and, and other sessions to educate others on this as well. But uh, your question is very valid, Adrian. Well, I appreciate that, Mike. And, and Adrian, I'm humbled by your praise. I, I would all offer that Drum and Reed, Daniel Bockenheimer and I spent nights and weekends at the, the, uh, at the beginning of last week um, putting together a draft blueprint around seven principles, which are similar to SSI, but also encompass the semantic rules engine aspect of it, which I think we, we kind of clearly laid out one the, the challenges and pain points we just alluded to here, as well as user experience, because at some level of the UI, you can't be sorting through, you know, I, I'm, oh, it's 2 p.m. and I'm in Turkey, so therefore I need credential number 52. Um, it, it's, it's got to have um, um, an easy, frictionless, seamless user experience too to the, to the boarding pass or whatever it is that you've got. 100%. And uh, now to move on to the next topic of conversation that we are going on to, there is a, co there is a COVID-19 app that uses the ability for AI to, to help in the predictive modeling. So blockchain, we're all pretty familiar that blockchain can help in verifying and uh, authenticating a specific uh, vaccination or a testing uh, result, but then being able to have an AI application that helps uh, to be able to sort out clarity and sense of control, that is also very needed. So there's a company out of DC called, or uh, they're Rockville, Maryland based, I believe, called United Solutions, who actually in the past has worked with Oki Mech, who is the HHS, I believe he's a director or lead for AI within Health and Human Services, as well as Jose Arrieta, who is the former CIO of Health and Human Services as well. Uh, they've created the blockchain um, network, uh, HHS Accelerate, to help for, uh, I believe that was grant, it wasn't grant management, it was just payment and claims reimbursement processing within a huge network um, for all their vendors. It was like vendor management uh, platform they had there. United was actually one of the vendors who supported and built that. And they now have built this uh, Seeky identity app to help record symptoms and then predict health outcomes and conditions through all of this. I did a couple, I saw their uh, videos. They have some things on GitHub, which are open source, but not much. I then uh, went and actually reached out to the team and said, hey, tell me about this. Uh, they have some interesting models and parameters that they're using to help uh, base in the predictive sense of what they're trying to do here. Uh, and so they're predicting outcomes like hypertension of lungs, predicting of uh, specific age and demographic information that can come from there. But uh, they don't have it in a totally federated model. And when I mean federated, where the information is uh, just stuck or not stuck, but is captured from the original point of entrance of the data information, like on a mobile phone or an EHR or anything like that. Uh, they more uh, are just <clears throat> uh, taking the information, making sure that you trust them as an entity to be able to create all these learning models off of it. So it's not totally privacy, privacy preserving at the moment, though that is a method they want to be able to get to and, and, um, and make possible. Uh, so they are operating under FedRAMP high requirements and through the FedRAMP requirements, they are using AWS actually to store all this data information. And they, uh, they have had a couple battles within the NIST protocols uh, of 800-803 to be able to meet to those different requirements so they could have the encrypted blockchain methods uh, of, of relevance to be able to use. But they are currently, I believe, only using it within Montgomery County, Maryland right now for uh, reporting. And, uh, and that's pretty much the sense I got from them. Uh, they are looking to expand their partnerships and partner with other people. So um, I appreciated David and his uh, details to, um, to his platform and, uh, and yeah, so that's all I got here. Did anyone else read this or, or find any interesting points of relevance? I don't know much about it, but I know David Nguyen and, and he did a lot of the groundwork for what um, Jose Arrieta implemented for what was, I think, a supply chain management solution in Fabric and, and the way they got the first federal ATO. Um, but I am inter interested to think that it's operating in a FISMA high environment because um, Fabric by itself isn't FIPS 140-2 compliant. So um, I'd be interested to get more from from David and Unisol, what they uh, what they what they configured. Yeah. 
at a higher level, Mike, I think this is an interesting approach, right? Uh, we, so we know that, uh, for example, IBM's uh, foray into health in, in the classic method of using a centralized system to, you know, do diagnosis and, you know, it didn't really take off that much. As a matter of fact, they're trying to palm that off right now, I think, uh, uh, because it's just not uh, the big success that uh, they hope it to be. So uh, I know a bunch of people, I will have to say from the high level view on that, I know a bunch of people in the Watson Health uh, and it, yeah. it's not that it wasn't beneficial. It was just very complex and the deal size they were getting wasn't in the hundreds of millions. It was more in just the tens of millions. And so right. that's kind of why they haven't gone into that avenue. And they have, so when you think of it, IBM has uh, hundreds of thousands of people that are responsible that are looking forward to, you know, receiving certain salaries and bonuses over the course of time. If you're not making hundreds of millions or, uh, you know, on certain deals and, and uh, solutions, it's not worth IBM's time. So that's why they're, they're looking to, kind of give the complex solution to others out in other networks. At least yeah, that, and I think that's why this is kind of the same conversation we had a few weeks ago about the general death of blockchain and all that, right? That's being bandied about just because IBM had to scale down on that area in general. Uh, so I was just going to make the same kind of, uh, just because, you know, I mean, it's not that technology, you know that. IBM's uh, AI technology can be chess champions and do all sorts of amazing things. So you are absolutely right. It's just the scale. And maybe the scale needs to be at projects like the one you just uh, uh, you know, showed, tries to solve a much smaller subset of problems uh, in, a, in a more decentralized way. And therefore it's likely to meet success because of the scale of operations. So. Uh, I think this is a, a great start again into this area and uh, applying these principles. Uh, so, anyone else on uh, COVID VCs and AI adding another component into uh, into predictive circumstances? Has anyone explored this at all? Developed it? Mike, has Marie Wallace from IBM been on to present their Health Pass? I got to reach out to her if you want to. No, I've talked to Jason Antha or Atha about um, potentially getting them involved in presentations here. Um, but yeah, if you could reach out to her, I would, I'd love to have them present IBM Health Pass because yeah. I'd love to have just diversity of thought. She's in, IB, she's in Ireland, so it, uh, it's a, a, a respectable time for her to be able to be on. Nice. Good to know. Uh, yeah, no, please, please reach out to her and you, you have my email. You can CC me on there and we can, uh, get her scheduled and something. No problem. Well, yeah. They're part of good health pass too. Yep. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, uh, we'll move on from that topic into man. NFTs have taken off, huh? Anyone have those top shot or, or other type of, uh, crypto collectibles. So we're all kind of familiar in, in industry of understanding, you know, trends and so on and so forth. Uh, I found this overview of NFT and a thousand true fans as a very interesting article by Chris Dixon. Chris Dixon is one of the partners uh, at uh, Anderson Horowitz, who is a VC firm based in Silicon Valley. Uh, he is their crypto and blockchain partner. Whenever he writes something, I pay attention and I try and understand it. Uh, I found this take very, um, very relevant. Pretty much in the beginning, he says, People always say they need to pro find product market fit so they can fit uh, millions and millions of users. When in reality, all you truly need is a thousand true fans and diehards that can be able to carry your business around. And so he goes over different ideas of DVDs and song artists of how, if you have a thousand you know, very true fans at your concerts, people will drive hundreds of miles away to be able to, to see you and, and be able to see you perform. And so within NFTs, we're at the point where you're able to have thousands of true fans be able to dedicate a lot of their wealth, a lot of their time, a lot of their energy to making this thing a thing. And, and crypto and, and specifically NFTs have been able to do that and create marketplaces for so many different things. Like for instance, uh, crypto collectible rankings over the past 30 days have skyrocketed within NBA Top Shop. And I've been luckily uh, close to this as, uh, since my days at Consensus in particular in 2017-18, NFTs and, and crypto collectibles were one of the uh, highly uh, discussed topics and were things about how we could truly make uh, different avenues of revenue along this line. 
And then when I was at Accenture, I had the privilege to be able to pitch to uh, the MBA of how a crypto collectible could truly make them money. They didn't see it uh, when I was presenting to them in summer of 2018 in particular, or they saw it, but they didn't know how to get started into it. And we referenced over Dapper Labs and some other entities. Don't think they took our conversation to heart many a times, but um, they obviously went to the foray and, and Dapper got so big where the MBA and other partners couldn't help but join into their, uh, their different type of solutions. But um, the yeah, NFTs are truly taken off. And uh, I think it's a, it's a new medium where, you know, if we were able to trust or we were able to have value in cardboard pieces of paper or cardboard pieces that had faces of baseball players or, or athletes on there and that we had, you know, bean bags that were shaped as animals, like beanie babies have value. Why can't something for maybe digitally native users or younger folks or, or people overseas that may be more digitally inclined, why can't a video clip that is enable or that enables them to have the ownership of it be worth the value as well? I mean, value is in the eye, eye of the beholder. There's even marketplaces today where uh, basketball shoes, which are really made between you know, five to $15, if they have a certain shape or a certain NBA player or, or athlete is assigned to them like Jordans, it could be worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars due to the situation, the moment and everything like that. And people can attribute to, uh, to different things in videos and videos and feel something from that. So if, if you feel something or get an, uh, you know, get a, an emotion from a video clip or anything like that, I think it's highly valuable or art, digital art that not only you, but millions of others can be able to own as well. Uh, it's worth something. So uh, that's my rant on NFTs. Any other <laughs> thoughts? Well, I, I really appreciate uh, if it was you that uh, attached that half hour uh, podcast uh, webcast uh, to the invitation about NFTs, uh, I thought um, uh, I, I thought that was a really really interesting uh, take on it. Uh, mostly because um, he's uh, talking about it uh, from the perspective not of financial value uh, or trading value, actually the opposite. Uh, but from the perspective of community building uh, in, in, the, in a nonprofit uh, context. And uh, I found, I at least uh, found that to be uh, a, a very important uh, perspective, uh, sort of uh, DAOs 2.0, if you want to think of it uh, that way. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, simply using uh, NFTs as the mechanism for uh, voting. Um, and uh, as he put it, uh, quadratic voting. Um, and, and this is decidedly not a corporate uh, use of, of the technology in the sense that DeFi uh, is. Uh, it, it's not fractional ownership. Uh, but rather it is uh, steering the attention of a community um, and, and growing it uh, based on the actual content of the community rather than a network effect, for example, or a Ponzi scheme uh, or anything in between. So the video, if anybody hasn't watched the video which you sent around, uh, it, it, it's really, really cool. And, that's and I just put it, in the, put it in the chat too. So uh, I think the Define has some good uh, content as well. And uh, they mentioned that, that whole uh, concept as well. If you don't want to read, this is a good audio or video visual representation for you to understand the concept too. So I um, hope it's relevant. Any other ideas, thoughts, or, or uh, points of note on this? Yeah, Mike, my, my team and I, uh, we're, we're looking at an extension of our project, um, exploring whether or not NFTs or verifiable credentials would be the better route for, for achieving what we're, we're looking to do. Um, and, and I guess I'd put it out uh, to everyone on, on, the, uh, on the call here. Um, you know, it, when you think about healthcare, uh, you know, we collectively have kind of come to the consensus that 
it, it's difficult for us to see how NFTs um, are really going to translate in, in a space where um, identity and security is so important. And, you know, especially without diving too, too deep into, into what we're, we're, we're envisioning, um, I, you know, NFTs may not be the best, best medium to, for, for achieving that. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's thought about it or, or, uh, or is working on anything similar, but, um, I, you know, it, it, it seems like, it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like there that there. There's probably as much utility in healthcare, uh, at least at least from my standpoint, or in what we're working on. And and uh, but but I mean I think it, I think it's brilliant and it's it's, uh, it, it's certainly here to stay. Uh, but but from a healthcare perspective, uh, there's just there's just too many other variables that, that you have to consider that that I I, I struggle to see where NFTs really have a place uh, in this market. So, so John, I'll offer for your consideration, and actually, I think in your defense um, that I agree with you 100%, but if we're willing to start doing blank slate thinking around how things could work, as exemplified by Airbnb and Uber, and et cetera, et cetera, um, the concept of NFTs being built around a, uh, an econometric market, uh, closed market between providers, some source of payment, and, uh, and, and employers in kind of a company mining town model that I like to refer to where, um, you know, the, 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 the Haven model of Amazon and JP Morgan, I think, and I'm just expounding here, but I think was unexplored because the idea that I have hundreds of thousands of employees, I have a financial network that's completely underwritten by my own finances. And all I need to do is buy an IDN uh, and have a, a healthcare delivery network, I can establish my own NFT slash crypto amongst myself for services I buy, which also allows me to create my own economic gamification and rules around uh, well-being and, and, and healthiness and all this sort of thing. And, and I think to your point, that's a little space flight, but it's, it's worth documenting to me. Oh, Jim, to totally agree, right? I I, I totally I totally agree with you on it. I I just know it, knowing the healthcare community like I do, um, I, you know, I'm not, I don't, I, I think it's something that you know, five to ten years from now, as uh, you know, blockchain solutions become more mainstream and more more widely adopted, um, I, I think it's something that that can become more prevalent. But I just think in the current environment to try to bring, you know, an, an NFT solution or 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 uh, some type of tokenization for for whatever, uh, I, I think I think there's going to be some pushback, especially right now when there's so much an emphasis on uh, patient uh, data security. And I, I think we've got to fight that battle first before NFTs really will will, will have a place in, in in the space. That's that's my opinion. I look, I I I. I I think it's extremely sexy, right? So, you know, as a, as a, as a business person, uh, you know, certainly I'd, I'd love to be able to find a way to, to, to do it effectively. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, you know, it's, you know, th this, we're, we're trying to, we're, we're trying to change, you know, uh, a healthcare system that is about as reluctant to change as they come. Uh, so, it, you know, try, trying to get them to, to, to change process and protocol, uh, even in things that that are extremely low hanging fruit and and uh, you know seem uh, simple, right? For for anybody to grasp, um, you know they're, they're usually reluctant to do it for for you know because it's it, it's not what they're used to doing, and everybody in healthcare hates change. Uh, so I you know for me it's like to, to invest in 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 that early on uh, in in trying to create you know somewhat of a paradigm shift in some some uh, you know in, in some pocket uh, of healthcare that we're working in. I, I just get concerned about, you know, is are, are we fighting a battle that that another battle has to be won before before we can even fight it? So John, no, exactly I, totally, right. I think we all kind of see that point of view, but I do want to transition to our last topic, which goes over. Uh, so clinical situations may not be as relevant for NFTs, but research, medical research could be an avenue where NFTs uh, come to market. So I found this this group uh, within uh, Research Hub in particular they distributed this project called Research Coin, where they were giving users the ability to curate, discuss, summarize academic literature so it's more digestible to other people. Since then, Research Coin gave away 
all of this, right, in particular, and they had some lessons learned on there. And what, uh, what the end result was is, sure, you may not be able to have a specific like, B2B model in this, but when it comes to user engagement and uh, being able to have, um, as you're getting paid for helping deliver more concise content or uh, summarize content, and being able to, to get this in the hands of not just, because academics can put language out for their publication and it cannot be, or some of it is not digestible to everyday people. Over time, if you have uh, different uh, networks and consortia like this, you can be able to not only increase engagement, but increase understanding of highly technical and complex academic literature. And so I found this project very interesting uh, somewhat in an NFT model, but it was more, they just wanted to give it away to see what the engagement was truly about. So I uh, wanted to get everyone's take on this in particular, as we have a couple minutes left on maybe doing this for medical research. Could it be something that's a reality for us? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely. And uh, uh, th this is, um, you know, this is where patient groups uh, sort of uh, could come together, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking as, you know, a CTO of patient privacy rights, a volunteer CTO of, an, of a privacy advocacy uh, nonprofit. Uh, the solving the problem of uh, data trust, uh, and there are seven different flavors of these kind of uh, communities of patients uh, organized to, to solve a particular problem, which you characterized as, uh, as research, which I think is a totally fair characterization. Um, it, uh, you know, a patient group is, is not interested in a financial outcome. They're interested in surviving the year. Uh, and uh, the, this ability, for example, of processing uh, research data uh, into, uh, you know, usable uh, uh, requests uh, for consent to contribute to various research projects or, or whatever to, to do the patients like me type stuff that we saw, you know, 15 years ago, uh, I think is a, a, could very well be uh, built around NFT principles. Awesome. I totally agree. I also just put in a note here. There's a company I'm familiar with here in the Philadelphia region because I love Philadelphia and I think it's the best city in the world called Health Union, uh, where they create uh, social networks for patients with chronic diseases. What I've always thought about is, hey, the more someone that is part of these social network groups, the more they add detail and the more um, they add kind of the clinical feedback loop, which they're doing in these current groups, and they have a ton of user engagement. If they were to reimburse those people for tokens, for the results or you know microtransactions of not just crypto but fiat currency you could be able to create a huge dynamic where these people want, would want to engage more within the health union app more so than ever and uh that's uh that's one game changing idea i can give to everyone today which is something i'm not doing at the moment but it could be very beneficial uh, maybe we do it at humana one day who knows or maybe we do it within thomas jefferson my research teams but uh but that's it for today um uh, I appreciate everyone's time. I do have to stop the recording because I have to go to an 11 o'clock meeting. Thank you everyone for the engagement today and the questions and the tidbits. John, I hope uh, we can get to clinical uh, NFT use cases one day, but maybe we just stick to research today. And, and, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. If you have any questions, you have my email. Uh, we do have an open topic for in two weeks. We may have the IBM team present. We may be having others. If anyone has any interesting companies, ideas, thoughts that they want to present, uh, please, it's an open forum to do so. And uh, I will see you guys in two Wednesdays from now. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.